Hello everybody and welcome to the episode number 53. This episode marks the first year of life of the Creative Insider and tomorrow will be the exact date, 11th of May 2020 is when we started and we've been consistent, 53 episodes one year later uh, and we want to thank you for, for the support so keep an eye on our social media channels because tomorrow we will be dropping something a little but special for our followers. In the meanwhile, we have managed to get a special guest for this first year of life, and that is Arturo Tedeschi. Arturo is one of the most internationally renowned computational designers. Uh, what, he, what made him famous is for sure his visionary approach and his research on advanced design methods. He got also very famous because he is the author of one of the Bibles regarding computational design with the famous... Um, program Rhinoceros and uh, the add-on Grasshopper and his book is Algorithms A Design. So if you want to be a computational designer, I really suggest you uh, to get this book. I have it myself. I have to start working on it more, but um, I have any. I don't have any sponsorships about this book, but it's really, really interesting. Uh, and if you want to develop yourself in this career path, I really suggest it to you. Um, we talked about um, the path of Arturo of getting where he is today. Um, he explained uh, where his passion started, that he had an interior struggle with his creative identity, which pushed him through becoming who he is today. It was a really interesting conversation to have, and it was really interesting to understand the different nuances of Arturo's personality and the way he thinks. Um, so it was not only about design, but it was about many different topics. And um, yeah, I suggest you to really listen to it because it can give you very um, interesting points of, of thought. But before we start, I want to thank you one more time for the support and remind you that if you haven't done this yet, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter on thecreativeinsider.com or follow our social media channels, which are Instagram at TCI Podcast and LinkedIn the Creative Insider, you'll find all the links below. Also, you will find that we have um, a little Patreon page. And if you can afford it and you can uh, help us a little bit economically, you can donate five bucks a month or any other sum you can dice. All the money you'll be donating will be reinvested into production gear to improve the quality of the show. We know that we constantly need to work on it and we really beg you to understand that it's not easy to work in a field that we're not expert, but I think we're steadily improving and bringing on better quality. So thank you very much. And we are also working on creating some perks for our patrons. Um, so for now, you can consider that um, as the head of a street artist. But um, yeah, soon we will be preparing something uh, interesting for the people who join the Patreon page. But now, enough introductions. Uh, please keep in mind tomorrow to check our social media channels for the surprises. And now, enjoy the conversation with Arturo Tedeschi. The whole world stops just like that. Hello, Arturo. How are you? I'm fine, Georgi. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me today. Great, great pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's nice to, you know, uh, have a book, have a name on the book, uh, which is the author and have the opportunity to talk with um, the person, a person that you usually have a one way conversation now, because when I read your book, I have a conversation with you, but uh, only you can give me some information. So thank you very much for accepting uh, the invitation for the podcast. 
No, my pleasure, really my pleasure, and thanks for mentioning the book. You know, when you write something, you always uh, think about your readers, you know, and uh, uh, I remember when I started, I, everyone, every writer has a kind of ideal reader that is, you know, sit uh, nearby and you think about it. So I didn't know that uh, in 2021 uh, you will have my book in your hand. So <laughs> great pleasure. Yes, um, it's interesting. I mean, I mentioned your book uh, as a starting point because um, I guess that um, this is the sort of, uh, from what I know, because I got the book because a friend of mine, uh, which works in the field of computational design, recommended to me. And she, she told me, oh, this book, uh, you need to buy it if you want to learn anything about computational design because it's sort of like the the bible the must have manual to 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 start and um for me that i've been always fascinated about uh, computational design but i'm myself not very skilled yet i know some basics so i decided to buy it and i decided to discover who is the name behind the book and what is the story so the first uh, thing I want to ask you is um, I'm, I'm really curious about every guest. If there was a moment in your life or what, what is the reason uh, which made you want to be a creative? Like when in your life you decided, I want to try to be a professional creative in your field? Uh, well, actually, uh, I know probably it sounds like a cliche, but I always... Uh, uh, being interested in, uh, you know, every kind of creative activity. I, I, since, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, maybe four or five years old, I, I started like playing with uh, cardboard uh, and uh, I was really interested in creating three-dimensional objects. So in a way, I started my career in computational design when I was four or five. Actually, you can probably divide, you know, people into two categories. You know, someone that uh, discovered uh, his passion, uh, you know, over the years. I always uh, done the same thing in a way. And I was really interested in, like, assembling things. I started with, you know, flat cardboard, like cutting it and creating shapes. And, and when I get older... Uh, when I was like a teenager, more or less, I started creating uh, like mock-ups uh, and uh, of uh, buildings. Like I remember, I clearly remember the, the Chrysler building in New York, you know, the skyscraper. And I created in a very accurate way. And I ran and stumbled into different, you know, geometric problems. Like how to, uh, I don't know, to develop a three-dimensional uh, geometry or surface into something flat. And so it was, everything was about trial and errors. If you have a kind of cone geometry and you want to splash it, you know, in a flat uh, geometry, you, if you don't have a computer, and I didn't have at that time, of course, uh, or you don't have particular geometrical skills or knowledge, you have to try and try. So that was my playground. And I always decide, not decided, I think I always... Uh, uh, follow this kind of flow and uh, being um, um, I, I, sometimes I define myself a geometric expert. Uh, it's difficult to say what a computational designer is today. Probably my I have a love for uh, um, for geometry basically and I try to apply it in different uh, uh, environments and industries and fields and objects uh, you know in a contact, constant research of beauty. Beauty is, is something that you cannot define. Everyone has a kind of personal idea. Uh, but the common thread is like a kind of um, interest for geometry that started when I was a kid. And I was fascinated by the complexity of some shapes uh, and how things are connected together. So that's the best answer that I can give you. So in a way, you know, the creative world uh, chosen me and not the opposite. No, I can totally relate to your answer because I think that um, more or less every kid that end up being a creative start with this discover towards geometry. You first start to 
by yourself, I don't know, simplify simple geometry and then you understand the beauty and then you more and more through your life understand more and more until you get to the point yeah. where you can actually manipulate geometry like it's vice and now you know enough of, about geometry you can create your own objects uh, and, and you know i uh, i never liked lego because they were so geometric and i, I always like to do three-dimensional shapes like with curves and smooth geometries and all I, so I, I when i received my first lego i had this kind of frustration because it was not possible to do accurate uh, freeform shapes uh, and so i decided to go with gar cardboard and doing object by myself so yeah that's a uh, you know probably the first flame and the first idea of like then moving to the, the control of the geometric aspects um I'm, I'm i'm curious um in in which moment of your life you actively started uh, learning um, towards the direction of getting a creative because you are from italy i grew up in italy um i'm also italian some some kind because i have an italian passport too uh and uh, for example in in my personal life i started going to a high school of arts um what kind of like you said when you were a teenager you started doing these mock-ups and was this school related projects or did you study that or you just do it on your own no all by my own because at high school uh, i follow a scientific direction uh, so but you know the funny thing is that when i started to the high school, I was very fascinated by humanistic uh, topics. So I really fell in love for literature, for also Latin and uh, classic topics in a way. And uh, I and I didn't sympathize that much for mathematics, but I started using the computer when I was at high school. Uh, we are talking about 92, 93, more or less. And I received one of my first computer. It was a basic computer. I don't know if you remember the Commodore 64. Uh, it's something really primitive, but fascinating in a way still. 92, 93, I was just born. So <laughs> not okay, really. that's right. You cannot remember. <laughs> okay, great. So I, I, I received my computer, my first computer, and I like to create uh, my first codes, my first programs in BASIC for animating geometries or doing simple tasks, you know. And then I was forced to learn mathematics in a way or to think mathematically. And then I combined my passion for uh, the sculptural approach, the, 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 the creative part of my life. And I combined it with mathematics. And then it was natural to choose architecture uh, in, uh, after high school. And I started architect studying architecture in 98. So it was uh, a very particular moment because it was a kind of transitional phase from analog to digital. I started with uh, drawing board by using pencil and papers. Uh, and um, only after two, three years, uh, the computer was accepted because I know that now it sounds really strange and odd, but uh, there were professors that they didn't accept the computer in, uh, in classroom. I clearly remember a kind of professor, they say, I will leave the room if you don't turn off your computers. Because, uh, of course, they were skeptical, they were scared about it. But I have to say that in, in the same way, um, there, were a kind of, there was a kind of counterbalance because if, in a way, they were not aware about the possibilities of uh, the digital world and uh, the use of the computers in terms of uh, as a creative tool, you know? Uh, are they really, and I come back to geometry, the, um, the, their teaching was about understanding the complexity, solving the complexity. And uh, so my foundation in terms of geometry and um, also in terms of, you know, for example, statics, uh, the engineering part comes 
from that specific moment in my learning career. So in a way, the digital was not accepted, but in the same time, the balance was about uh, a deep understanding of geometry, mathematics, uh, engineering. And so uh, it was a kind of um, strange in education in a way, because I re clearly remember that we started also studying uh, the history of, of architecture only on a paper magazine. Sometimes, uh, and it sounds really odd with postcards, you know, of buildings. And buildings, they were always captured by the same point of view. I clearly remember, I don't know, the Villa Savoie or Ronchamp by Corbusier or other important building, you know, always from the same point of view. So it was a kind of exercise of imagination that forced me to go beyond, you know, what was in front of my face and trying to imagine, trying to push the boundaries because we had a lot of boundaries. <laughs> And not just for the sake of pushing, you know. I'm curious, uh, which uh, which university did you join, and which uh, faculty? And um, yeah, yeah, I studied in Naples, in in uh, southern Italy. Uh, the school is the Federico II. That is one of the um, like most ancient school in uh, universities in the world. Um, and it was, um, as I as I said before. That school is uh, has a good balance between, I would like to say, uh, art and science uh, that in a way fueled my passion for complexity. And so, uh, it, I, I mean, I don't know the, the current uh, uh, you know, orientation of the school, but at that time was always, every, everything was about staying in between art and science. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, it influenced me, maybe, you know, in a kind of indirect way, because no one told me uh, how to use the computer, how to use the digital tools, not only in terms of how to use software, as you can probably imagine, but uh, how to under, how to conceive the, the computer as a creative tool for express uh, creativity and uh, the potential of a new approach. Yeah, I mean, as someone that I have studied in Rome and La Sapienza, and I joined the university at, I think, 2012. And uh, the first year was the same thing. You, you weren't allowed to use the computer and uh, you were introduced slightly to some CAD softwares. Um, but then the most of the things you needed to discover yourself. I was, I was lucky enough that I was coming from a school of arts, which uh, already gave me some basics about Rhino, about, about um, AutoCAD and these basic softwares, Photoshop. Uh, but then you need to build upon yourself. And it was just lucky enough. And the other students really were starting from zero. And um, uh, you studied architecture, right? Like your yeah, basic yeah, architecture. Be yeah. because currently your your design career has spread uh, across uh, every possible realm of design i think yeah that's a I, I never imagined to end up doing different things because yeah probably you know this kind of multidisciplinary approach is something that I learned over the years. I, and I really had the opportunity to work in different industries, from footwear to automotive, uh, from product design to architecture. Uh, that's something that probably is a, is a consequence of the computational design approach, which is combined with a love for design, design in, uh, in general, when I say design, I mean uh, creating things that in a way they respond uh, to a social need or to a personal need. And uh, well, when I studied architecture, my idea was uh, trying to understand the art of construction in order to create buildings. And so to me, creating buildings was, buildings was the, the maximum ambition. Then I randomly, and really, uh, it was not a decision, but when I started learning computational design, or to be precise, because you there is not a precise path 
for you cannot you don't become a computational designer you fell in love with the digital world i i always like to say and you create your own path when i started to to, to create this path i i fell in love with uh with product design and then with footwear is a it was a kind of uh, it was a path with I, I didn't have any kind of specific goal no? but uh, the path itself was a way to collect new information and discovering new like also people that influenced me in the years by year i'm curious you you said you studied in naples at the university yeah. there and uh, now you're based in milan um yeah, exactly. i'm i'm curious how did you move from from naples to to milan what was the 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 transition that happened there how come that you moved to milan was it just for work because um in italy it's you know renowned around the world that the people from the south generally move to the north because yeah. it's more productivity area and yeah, exactly. milan is the design capital of of italy and one of the design capitals of europe i guess well actually again it was not a like a precise decision but it's a consequence of the learning path i was talking about and uh, basically i spent my first four years after graduation i worked in the interior design in naples basically even if i worked in different cities uh, and uh, i discovered rhino for example but i discovered uh, and i started writing after four years from you know the graduation so i uh, the first time i downloaded and installed rhino on my computer i was more or less 27 or 28 years old so after four years of uh, traditional uh, profession if you like and uh, when i start uh, when i started like writing the books and then doing my first experiences uh, i have done different like exhibition and collaboration with uh, uh, in Milano and with people and, and offices in Milano. So it was very natural after a while to move to the city. As you mentioned, of course, Milano is the capital of design and fashion. And uh, of course, it has a kind of polarity <laughs> toward everything that is involved with the, the world of creativity. So uh, it was not a decision. I will move to Milano because I will find opportunities. But in a way, the opportunities like drove me to uh, to the city but i also worked in london for a for a period of time i collaborated with zadid architects and uh, i always also lived in london in a kind of um, transitional moment of my life when i really was i was looking for inspiration i was looking for uh, i'd like to stay in a place where things were happening and I'm talking about the period 2009-2010. A lot of things were happening in the city at that time. And so I really like to be to absorb that energy. And in a way, the, the first book, which is not AAD, the one that is in on your desk right now, but the first book is called Architettura Parametrica, that was uh, written and published in Italian and then translated into Parametric Architecture with Grasshopper. Uh, the first book is like uh, a consequence of a trip in London. I was there after my four years of experience in the interior design, and I ran into this sculpture at uh, AA School. It was a sculpture designed and fabricated by students, in a way. And I really fell in love with that sculpture. You know, they call it the Stendhal Syndrome. You see a piece of art and your life changes and that sculpture that was intricate uh, made using uh, you know cnc machines uh, i really uh you know it was in my I, I felt the same frequency i really wanted to do that thing and then when i come back to italy i started writing architettura parametrica that was a way to collect ideas and to share knowledge when you write a book it's not only about uh, 
sharing it's also about organizing ideas and so for me the first publication was a way to uh create a kind of theoretical spine a structure you know between among my ideas my uh, also the the knowledge and developed so far uh, until then I'm curious, um, did you first start uh, working with Rhino and then saw this sculpture or you just first saw the sculpture and then you wanted to do to be able to do this exact thing? I guess you, you first discovered Rhino on your own because right after you started writing a book and to start writing a book, you need to know about what you're <laughs> writing. Well, um that's a funny, uh, yeah, it's a funny story because I, I did install Rhino and I didn't use it actually. So, you know, you open the software, you play with geometries and then I, I didn't use it like after a while. But uh, when I saw the, the sculpture, I clearly understood that it was not possible to create it using just a manual approach. But there was a kind of DNA behind, a code um and so the uh, the question was which kind of software or tools allowing you to create uh, allows you to create something like that and so i remember that i started some like research on the internet and grasshopper popped up as a name and was like a very um a new software I, I think the, ver the first version was about 2007 2008 so just one two years after and uh and so grasshopper works inside rhino and then i said okay i have to study both grasshopper and rhino in the same time and so that's the story basically but i'm, I'm curious uh what was the the learning process the learning curve of someone that um, was starting this uh, this process because you know like people nowadays see uh, everybody I guess everybody who are into this kind of design they might know your name because your book is out there when you look for parametric design um, but uh, like when you when you started you clearly you started since the beginning and you were starting as you said in Italy where there was a little bit of conservative culture and um, you were starting from zero with I guess no no one to teach you you were uh, I and for me this is always very fascinating because it's like creating a new workflow a new a new way of completely working with something and um, how did you do it because I guess something like that. I mean, if I were about to start learning now with all the yeah. all the information that I would have, it would take me still a long time because it's not something simple. I mean, at least for yeah. me, it's not. How did you manage to, because you spend a lot of time, so you were doing it beside your work. Uh, exactly. you, how, how was the learning curve? Like what were your first difficulties? How you overcome that? Yeah, honestly, it was easier than today. And uh, it probably sounds uh, uh, strange and uh, it sounds like a paradox, but at that time I had, and also other colleagues and designers and people, students, uh, they had a lot of ambitions. Ambitions, I mean, all, not only in terms of career, but in terms of what we wanted to achieve also ge even ge only geometrically, you know? And then you had the few tools in order to do that. So I remember, for example, when we created the, the first, uh, um, one of the first 3D printed shoes, it was um, for an exhibition, uh, we used like something like three or four different softwares and something that was not specifically created for designing shoes, but for the for op this, um, sculptural sorry structural optimization for example and then we combine everything together in order to achieve that specific goal nowadays you have i don't know how to say but like tons uh, hundreds thousands of different tools or plugins for example for grasshopper which is the main tool that i used that i use and um, Today is difficult to it's more difficult to create a learning path because you basically have all the possible 
uh, options in order to create something. At that time, I had a lot of desires, ambition, design ambition, and uh, a kind of direction. And so I created my tools using uh, the few options that software were offering at that time. In terms, you know, of in order to be very practical, as you said, I was uh, like Bruce Wayne in the morning and Batman at night. I was working in the morning in order to pay the rent. And at night, uh, I started solving one problem, you know, per time. I was like, I, I really had a kind of a set of things to accomplish. And I played and I, and I, I didn't leave the chair until the work and the solution was found. That was for me the main approach. So, for example, yeah, we I was like designing a shoe, or we I was designing a detail for a facade, and I never left my chair until the work was done. And so uh, it implied the use again of different software, uh, collecting different books. Uh, um consulting with different people you know and also the community was very helpful the grasshopper community and the rhino community community they were both really really helpful in order to speed up you know the learning process and you know one brick on top of the other and uh after one year i remember that i had a kind of pile of different uh, uh, you know, notes uh, and uh, uh, other books uh, and different things. And then I decided to share the knowledge, the knowledge uh, collected that, in that uh, moment with my first book. Are you, are you, were you a very structured person uh, as a personality? Because, I mean, um, to achieve something like that, a part of being an architect and some basic knowledge that you, some initial knowledge you had to have, um, where, how, because it requires a lot of discipline, like it requires a lot of discipline because especially in the beginning, it's counterintuitive, but the first steps are very hard because you need to get momentum yeah. and maybe you'll spend the whole night and you'll just, I don't know, create a series of lines or something really stupid and you think oh my god i spent two hours to do something that uh it's not really useful and also all these notes to put them in a structured way that you can build upon so i'm curious mm. did you have some system are you like naturally <laughs> somehow structured uh well no actually uh, i'm not that precise i'm not that structured as a person even if probably it looks the opposite but i'm not that structured but actually i want to say that uh, two things like uh, were driving me the first thing was a kind of frustration for architecture because as i said before my ambition when i was uh, a young architecture student was creating buildings, designing buildings and creating buildings. And after four years of profession, I felt a kind of frustration because uh, I don't know how to say, but when uh, I had the opportunity to, to really work in the architecture field, I, I did understand that uh, you are just a little gear in a complex mechanism. I didn't have any kind of control. I felt the frustration when, when I was seeing that my initial idea was compromised every time. And so frustration was the first thing. And I have to be also very honest that I also sometimes had problem to pay the rent with the, you know, uh, with earnings coming from the professional architecture. And so frustration was the first driver and the second was trying to create my own path that was not only again in architecture but was something in parallel because i always have this kind of fascination fascination by for objects in general so i say that in that moment well probably is not only architecture my destiny 
if I want to control, if I want to protect my ideas, maybe I have to change scale. And in that moment, uh, finding a new way along with the frustration was a super powerful driver that gave me the structure and also um, consistency and um, gave me the the energy for you know spending as i said before for becoming batman every night for on, almost one year and i guess if you don't have a specific goal if you don't feel and maybe this word is like uh, sounds strange but if you don't feel the fear to fail if you don't have if you don't you should have something to move from you really need to to feel the urge to change in order to have this kind of uh, consistency and to persevere every day and it was not easy of course as you can imagine even because there were no you know help or uh, any kind of support in that moment as we said before from you know the academic world because i was not connected with the university I, i'm not a researcher for example so everything was created in a kind of interstice between the profession and just a kind of vague idea of a new profession coming on yeah i mean it's still uh, very remarkable because you know i think a lot of designers and a lot of architects feel that um, depression so to say after a few years in the profession because you come from the world of university where you're like a flea, free bird flying around experimenting with uh, your ideas you you are in charge of everything and then you s smash yourself into the world of reality where you're like as you said a little wheel in the mechanism and you have your yeah. boss your clients everybody you know smashing <laughs> smashing you down and then you need to you know think oh my god what i'm doing here so um this is like um everybody have this uh initial Feeling. crisis yeah. i guess uh but you know some people just cannot uh, you know they they cannot push back and you were one of those that actually use this powerful energy and mm -hmm. to to push back um and so you said you, it, it took you almost one year to to be able to do to know what you're doing when you sit in front of a grasshopper, yeah. um, what do you think? What do you think is the the most important um, initial knowledge that you have to know to you know learn um, learn well this this kind of softwares? Because um, for me, for example, for me, it's very important. Then when you start, you build good foundations that you really build the foundations and then you start built upon because um it's if you want to cheat you can nowadays easily go get some algorithm pre prefabricated from someone use it to obtain the result what you want but uh for me it's interesting to to build upon your your own skill so that you can actually use the tool um is it more do you need a lot of mathematics or do you need a lot of geometrical thinking and logic because for example i have had um, um the um, computational design expert of big new york oliver thomas and he said no i don't know that much mathematics i know just a little bit of coding logic i can understand geometry and that for me is enough what is your point of view well, there is something before, which is you need to change your mindset in a way. Mostly if you are a talented uh, uh, designer, because if you have a talent, for example, if you are, are a good, uh, if you have drawing skills, for example, trying to simulate with the computer what you can achieve with your pencil, it's it takes a lot of time so you can feel a lot of frustration you give up i had a lot of students for example that they, someone that was really really talented in terms of creating objects with hands with uh, um, with pencil you know just trying to visualize things and they were not good computational designers but you know why because you really have to change your the way you think about the creation of objects 
um, computational design or parametric design, you know, the, the best way to describe it is like algorithmic design, or as I call it, AAD, algorithm aided design, because you need to create objects through algorithms. Now, an algorithm is, a, can, is a, similar to a recipe. You have a precise step, um, set of steps, very simple, and uh, you have ingredients, you have tools, and so you should be very organized and structured, as we said before. So in order to create a nice shape, you have to forget about your hands, about your manual ability, and you need to think in a new kind of way. Now, this way of thinking, of course, intersects with mathematics, with coding, with geometry, sometimes with uh, uh, structural uh, skills or knowledge. Okay, if you are creating a super intricate uh, shape and you need that this thing stands up, you need to calculate the deformation of that object, for example. Even if you have an engineering team uh, that will work as a consultant later on, you need to understand how things work together. So there are different things that you need to manage. I mean, mand the, the mandatory skill is geometry to me. And uh, something that I realized also as a teacher is that in a way, nobody teaches architectural geometries, geometry at schools. I mean, there is representation in a way or there is the mathematical aspects of geometry, but the architectural geometry, which is how to manage the sculptural complexity, how to create a shape, how to control a shape, how to manage the curvature, how to um, create continuity between different surfaces. You know, the architectural geometry is something that is not uh, taught at school. So, I mean, geometry is the main things you need to control when you want to play with uh, uh, with uh, computational design tools. Um, mathematics, you know, uh, you don't you don't need to be an expert, or you don't have to solve you know differential equation or something super uh, you know complex in order to play with the grasshopper or. Uh, but for example, you know, something very basic, the control of vectors, vector fields, uh, uh, or um, simple mathematical equation are important in order to influence your design and to play with complexity. You know, there are a lot of amazing and beautiful architectural shapes that are the direct uh, consequence of equation, for example. The um, rooftop of uh, the British Museum in London was created using different approaches, but at the end, they wrote a kind of equation in order to uh, generate that shape. Um, so uh, basic, a foundation of geometry and mathematics are anyway essential, but before you have to change your mindset and you have to think in terms of algorithms for every action and every uh, gesture in the design world. Yes, I think that, for example, this for me so far, it's uh, have been a very big stop and challenge because I'm more like I can imagine a shape I can start. Yeah. And, and the fact that has stopped me so far is that I'm uh, through my logic of geometry, I can build everything within Rhino because Grasshopper in the end of the day uses um, creates an algorithm that uses the tools that are within Rhino. So yeah. but the, the powerful tool is that within these parameters, then with one so to say, uh, script, you can generate variation of the same model in infinite yeah. time. And um, this is uh, something something that, for, for example, I'm one of those people that has have had difficulties. Um, but um, back to your story, because like this is the initial foundations and then you have completed this one year. Um, through this one year, you have learned uh, Grasshopper. Um, these first exercises that you have done, were they somehow work-related or you have imposed yourself, okay, I'm going to do some uh, personal research ideas which I develop in, with this um, parametric design? Or 
How... No, it was totally, it was a personal research and for probably one year and a half, I overlapped the Batman and the Bruce Wayne thing. So I still work in a, as an architect uh, in, a, in a traditional office. Uh, and again, at night I was doing my researches. I can call it just research, but I started teaching. Mm -hmm. That was also an important, uh, um, you know, change point in my in my career because teaching was, and it sounds a cliche, like a cliche, probably it was a way to learn from students, from their uh, questions, for example. And uh, it really helped me in uh, going on in this idea of structuring uh, knowledge and my research into something uh, that looked like a theory because that, that, that's very important. It's not only about uh, managing a tool, you know? It's not like, uh, okay, I'm an expert in, uh, in, in Rhino or in uh, 3D modeling. It was like creating a, a theory, uh, a theory with uh, a kind of very practical foundation and, and implications. So that was the first year enough more or less this kind of overlapping between two direction and you know when you change your life uh, towards something which is really unknown everything looks uh, like a kind of simulation you cannot you don't really believe that it will become your job you don't believe in yourself you know when i started working when i started like uh, uh presenting myself as a computational designer, even if I didn't use this kind of word, you really don't believe in yourself. You just just think, let's say, yeah, I hope that my this client or this potential client uh, uh, will, um, I don't know, uh, believe in my potential, but you don't believe in yourself because you don't have a real like foundation on, on that. So there was a moment where everything looked like a simulation. And I was saying, okay, let's do it for one month and maybe I will come back to the profession. But different opportunities arrived and, uh, you know, have, with the real life problems, issues and opportunities, you really grow up, you really grow up and then you become a real professional in, in a specific field. So, um, um yeah it that was a strange moment that at the beginning when i didn't believe that it was a real profession let's say i mean i think that everybody have this moment when they start something where they like you need to push yourself to say say to define yourself or something that you're not yet uh, and then uh, suddenly after a while you realize you you have become that that person uh, and after this, after you have finished this year and a half of uh, like, I don't know, sleeping very few hours, I guess. <laughs> uh, and I don't know what kind of personal yeah. relationship you could have. Uh, zero. <laughs> zero, yeah. <laughs> like zero, only with the computer, more or less. <laughs> I say, sometimes I say that in that period, I was like a computer device. So I disconnect myself before going to sleep, like a mouse or like a printer, you know, like a device, like an external device. Yeah, but you know, like I, it's really like, it, it's like deciding to go through a, a punishment, so to say, it's, I don't know, it's like, uh, you know, when you, some people, when they have cancer and they survive it, they feel way, very, way better when afterwards, you know, because they have they had this very big pressure and then they have overcome it. And with you was like a one year and a half, which you undergo massive I can only imagine because you know you yeah. uh, one year it's with very few hours of sleep and work and the mental work it's very hard mm -hmm. um, and then what did you do after this you quit your job and you said okay I'm gonna take the leap and try to find my own clients or what were your first jobs as yeah, a yeah. freelancer yeah, first of all it's very interesting what you say about the self-punishment actually I I think that every architect uh, has a kind of period of masochism in a way. For example, uh, b before the grasshopper part, let's say, I remember that during the four years of profession, I um, worked for different competitions 
And that was my phase of masochism because uh, I spent a lot of time for the competitions, you know, preparing the drawings uh, uh, and spending so many nights, but I was, you know, 90% uh, aware that I, I don't know, I, it was just a sacrifice with no results, you know, when I was like working and I was researching in the computational fields, I really was, I was seeing a kind of light uh, at the end of the tunnel, even if it was very tiny as like, uh, uh, not that intense, but I was seeing a kind of light. So that helped me to, again, it was my driver. And uh, yeah, I re clearly remember one day when I said, uh, if I really believe in myself uh, and I, I really believe in developing a career, I need to take a decision. And the decision was like cutting, uh, you know, with the past. It was like... Uh, uh changing everything and um without any kind of parachute that was important because in that moment and uh if you are wondering if i had a kind of um, um you know savings or the opportunity to go ahead in my research uh, with no money with no yeah you need to feel the fear as i said before i didn't have any kind of parachute that that helped me in uh, putting all the energies and the focus in uh, in the next phase in, of my career and this next phase was like as like did you, did you just quit your job or did you find I, yeah. I find what was your plan what was your game plan when you were about to quit your job like did you yeah. have already some clients or something or you just were like no, okay to I'm... be super to be super transparent uh, it was uh, i survived at the beginning thanks to the book for example you know you get rights and then was you, you have the copyright and then uh, you have royalties, you get royalties for that. So the book was the first way to survive because it was just a surviving at the beginning. But um, uh, how, and, how did you, uh, yeah. like you, you wrote this book with, I guess, all the notes that you have created uh, along, along your own research. Um, how did you find the publisher? Uh, who did you went to to say, okay, because if tomorrow i go with a book about i don't know something new that i don't know ntfs or something that's really new yeah, yeah, now yeah. like let's say ntf is the new thing if tomorrow yeah. i go with a book about this like people will be like who who you are like yeah. why should we trust that you are a person that yeah. wrote a yeah. legit book so you wrote a book and f did you find first the publisher and explain your idea how did that work? uh yeah, the first idea when I when I was when I said okay, I have to create something which is an organized knowledge, an organized set of things, uh, chapters, paragraphs, something. Uh, the, the, you know, the first reaction, the first idea was let's put it online for free. But I said it's something that should be printed in order to be more effective and powerful as a message, also. You know. And I remember that I I sent email to three or four important uh, publishers in Italy because the first version was in Italian, as I said before. Uh, yeah, no one answered, as you can imagine. Then I remember that a friend of mine, a colleague at the university, one of my um, schoolmates, uh, opened, ran a, he had a small, uh, publishing uh, company in southern Italy again and so, uh, then I just like called him and I say okay I remember that you are running a publishing company what do you think about a book about algorithms and design and he said he was a bit skeptical at the beginning and he said okay yeah we can try because we are kind of friends we uh, I believe in your ideas so we can do it but um, with a couple of conditions. The book should be in black and white, so no colors in order to save, uh, you know, costs, printing costs, and only 300 copies. That were, that I had 
basically these two conditions and i accepted because i didn't have other other options and i remember that we sold the copies out in uh, two weeks more or less and then we printed other like copies and then we i wrote uh, also another different version with uh, more pages more contents uh, uh, so sometimes when you don't have resources, you need to um, really focus on your network. You need to, I don't know, open your phone book and then you need to understand if your network of friends uh, or acquaintances or whatever can really help you. So in that moment, I didn't have money resources or I, I couldn't publish by myself there were not services like uh, amazon you know today you can uh, print your own book with uh, a tool which is online and then you just publish it yes. at that time we didn't have that thing, that kind of thing so uh, i just relied on my network and so that's it that's the story and uh, uh, and i'm also very happy that i also gave a contribution to to Le Penser, which is the publisher that now is an important um, which is also the publisher publi company the publisher of the second of the second book i guess algorithms exactly. aided design and yeah. um, this one has colors so <laughs> yeah a lot of a lot of pages and for, yeah full of colors yeah exactly. nice nice paper nice to touch nice smell when you <laughs> open it i can say everybody that uh, it's really uh it looks black and white from the outside but it's <laughs> colorful inside yeah it's colorful and uh, let's say for aad uh, I wrote the conditions. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's nice. But I guess that in this difficult situation, it was even maybe an advantage. I don't know, because I know that when you publish a book, the real amount of money that in the end go to the author of the book are not that many. Is it the same when you publish something so specific as your books? Or is it still a very low percentage? Uh I, uh, again, to be super transparent, uh, for the first edition, again, uh, I didn't have any contractual power, I don't know how to say. So uh, if in our audience there are people that they want to publish a book, the I don't know, the percentage is something like 10% to the author and 90% to the publisher. And this is just, you know, a kind of range, uh, it's a rough... Uh, uh, distribution, but more or less, we are talking about something like that. So, uh, due to to the thanks to the success of the first two editions, uh, I let's say negotiated this kind of balance for AAD. Um, and yeah, but basically, I would suggest for 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 new writers also to like go in the direction of self-publishing. But uh, there is something very important to say because sometimes uh, the amount of work uh, of a publisher is undervalued, but there is a lot of commitment in, you know, in the distribution, you know, if you just write and publish on Amazon, for example, nobody will do, uh, you know, the commercial part or the advertising or connecting the book with people that will resell it. You know, there are resellers all around the world. And I have to say that in my case, in my situation, Le Penser was absolutely crucial for, you know, this kind of, um, for the distribution. Yeah, you know, it was very, very important. What I like about your story if so far is something that I, I, I read recently because I read a lot of these books in different aspects, not only about parametric uh, yeah. architecture, but I read book about business, about leadership, about uh, many topics. And I found this book, which is called uh, Architect Entrepreneur. Um, yeah, yeah, I and, read it. And there are two books. There is one yellow and one blue. And the second one explains uh, scalable, scalable products and uh, passive incomes for architects. Yeah. And if you started vice versa, you know, generally architects starts with ser selling their service. And the problem with the service is that you have a limited amount of hours and you can sell, I don't know, 
16 hours let's say you have to sleep yeah, yeah. but if you have books like you do you have this flow of secu i don't know if it's security but still something that you know keeps you maybe pay the rent and yeah. um and then nowadays we have so many opportunities i saw on your website you have recorded uh, webinars you have exactly. uh, you have a huge social media presence which is also important because a lot of the traditional uh I don't would say only people in architecture, but people in general underestimate the power of social media because mm -hmm. if you have a thousand true fans and you do a book, these thousand fans will buy it. And so you will, um, yeah, you, this is, I, I think it's a very nice uh, also base that you can build upon. Uh, you know, when I was in my frustration phase that I mentioned before, I was reading different books at the time. I had a lot of time, uh, you know, it was before my research phase. And I was reading uh, business books. And uh, also I discovered uh, Delirious New York by Ren Kulas and also learning from Las Vegas. I don't know, I combined many things together because Ren Kulas started with a his career started with a book which is delirious new york it was not famous before that book it was a teacher at aa school in london but uh, the celebrity let's say arrived with that book so in my mind this idea of like uh trying to succeed through a publication not through a building again I started with the idea of creating buildings and uh, in a, a particular moment I said maybe I can uh, succeed, I can achieve that goal not in a direct way but in a kind of different path. And the business books that I was reading at the time, they were saying basically if you don't have money, if you, don't, if you want to create uh, incomes or passive incomes or you want to maybe royalties is the only thing that you can do so how can you generate royalties you can write a book because you just need a pen you know or uh, or you need just a word processor which is nowadays is free it's for free and that's it you just put your ideas because you cannot do a movie or it's difficult to produce a music album if you don't have any if you don't have one uh, uh penny you know or one euro and the only thing that i could do at that time was writing a book so i i combined uh those references in a way in my mind they like gave me this idea I because think... of course writing a book is not the first idea that popped up in in a mind uh, when you want to pay the rent or you want to go ahead in your profession I mean, the book also has to be good, but I think nowadays you have the opportunity to produce many different contents. Also, exactly. maybe maybe exactly. a movie also it's possible with the cheap technology nowadays. For example, I'm producing this, this this podcast costs a few thousand euros, and like it cost just because I wanted to buy nice stuff. <laughs> uh, it yeah, could yeah. it could be that it started for free. You can start with zero. You can start with really very low costs of of production. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely true and it, it is a measure of the distance uh, and the acceleration of technology and uh, possibilities that we had in just 10 years yes. 10 years ago it, we didn't have instagram more or less instagram was not there or uh, we didn't uh, the youtube of 2008 was not uh, the youtube that we have right now or the platforms as you said before um we are doing webinars or the possibility of the e-learning they had an acceleration which is incredible in the over the last five years i would say yes i i, I think so and um and okay you started with the book you had some royalty to keep you so to say yeah. a, a life above water and uh, <laughs> <laughs> which were your first uh your first professional assignment as a designer and um what was your yeah what was your path uh, you, you, men you, you mentioned the social media i remember that i was very active on twitter that was the main social network in 2009, 2010, along with Facebook. But Facebook was more personal. Twitter was also 
you know, a kind of he had a kind of public nature and DNA. And I remember that I was putting my sketches, hand sketches, on the, on on Twitter, and someone like noticed that, and uh, they really proposed me to do an exhibition. Uh, and uh, I started with a project in Rome. It was a sculpture in the Chiostro del Bramante, which is a, uh, um, a parametric sculpture. W with parametric, I would say that I used parametric tools in order to generate it. It was a the, my first. Uh, built projects uh, inter that used you know this kind of new freedom and uh, was the first time that i was expressing myself as a digital artist um and i didn't sleep for yeah probably two weeks uh, i remember that was re i was really really scared when i uh, when i was designing and uh, when we were manufacturing the process. In that moment, I felt the responsibilities of creating something that was intended for a public space, for a, an important exhibition in Rome that involves so many people. And I was in the middle with my new skills, let's say, a lot of ambition and, and passion, you know, we, uh, the, the passion and again, uh, the, the idea of like express my vision, my ideas, my ghosts. Sometimes it was very important. And um, I learned a lot from that project. Like also how to simplify the complexity because when you want to, uh, when you are in front of a client uh, and you spend probably 200 hours uh, in uh, the algorithmic world and you want to explain the output, of the intrigues and the complexity of that thing, you need to learn new communication skills because the objective is always the beauty. I always designed for people and I never designed for designers. You know, it's very simple to, to speak about algorithms with other colleagues. It's very simple to do it with people in the same industry and environment. But when you are in front of a client, you need to develop storytelling skill. This is absolutely important. And that project was the first moment when I realized that along with the grasshopper computational skill, geometry, mathematics, and whatever, I started developing my storytelling skills. And that, um, that project was about 20 to 2011. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. And, and from there, it rippled towards new assignments. He did that project yeah. then? Yeah, it was, uh, um, yeah, of course, uh, thanks to the, the success. And, you know, the, it was like published on different magazines and so on. And it was very important. And, you know, as I said before, along with research, I also started teaching. And in the first moment, I also had a lot of students that they have become uh, clients later on. Because when I say students, they were sometimes CEOs of companies or directors of architecture studios, offices. And, uh, um, and I also started doing uh, um, like uh, teaching and training within companies. That was very important. So I started to do, you know, consulting and training for uh, sometimes for leading, worldwide leading companies. And uh, uh, that was really important in order to have new projects. You know, when you teach something to someone, um, you also create a connection and trust, you know, and that was... Uh, an important, uh, um, another important way to get new 
Yeah, I mean, when they learn something from you and they then apply their skills, they know that you're a legit person because yeah. uh, it's very easy to put a commercial in front of the person, but it's way more different to spend a few hours with them by teaching them a skill, which when they go back on their own and it works and and so they know who to go to. Um, was Is there a moment when like when you got an assignment or a request for these services from, I don't know, a certain company or person that made, made you feel, okay, finally I feel est established, I finally feel I arrived at the point where I needed to be and, uh, so to say, let you drop this heavy burden that you have had before you said your 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 story it's uh sounds to me like a little bit like the divine comedy you know you you lost your way <laughs> you got through hell yeah. <laughs> you got through hell uh there was a little bit of purgatory and now maybe it's paradise <laughs> or at least something like that yeah but probably I, i mean still in between you know uh, i'm not in in, in heaven uh, uh well i never felt uh, i never i don't know to say did trespass that moment there is not i think that line but uh probably as i said before at the beginning it sounded like a simulation again i was acting in a way i'm acting like a computational designer Now, after 12 years, uh, I'm not acting anymore. But, you know, there is something interesting that st since we are working in uh, every day, we are facing different problems. So every day, we, in a way, we start from zero. For example, in 2016, uh, we have the opportunity to work on an on a automotive project for a um, um, city car that is in the market since... Uh, two days more or less if i remember for uh, this called the uh, xcv we worked uh, on, on that project uh, and we it was like you know starting from scratch I, i was again a kid playing with cardboard so when you change radically and drastically the the playground you start from scratch and so it seems again a kind of simulation so that feeling in a way helps me to stay in between uh, hell and heaven so i'm still I, i still feel the fear sometimes i still feel the the pressure and uh, the ambition to go ahead but i never feel the frustration that's the most important thing to me uh, i never said okay now i can settle down i'm total secure now i i i feel like a, you know a, an old cowboy of computational design no never because every time we start a new collaboration so we start from zero and in 2014 we started working for in footwear for example if, if you are an architect you never imagine to design a shoe for example so but, it's not just another work you really start from scratch again and you are a kid yeah but the thing is that also you know like um, this is um, another like um think that when you are born an architect let's say by born i say you like uh, yeah. have graduated school and you have learned so many things about the same subject And then there is also a little bit, you know, fear and also um, refusion to to do something else because you define yourself as an architect, exactly. and then yeah. and then you think, okay, why should I do this? I don't do this. But it's important to jump fields. Uh, for example, for me also, when I started the podcast, it was very important to not do it about architecture, but to do it about creativity because in the past uh, there were these cafes in paris or in rome in uh, florence in milan in naples where uh, different artists from different fields would exchange um, opinions and uh, exchange knowledge and then they will influence each other uh, and 
nowadays it's of course because of the pandemic but in general we don't have this kind of interaction so i thought okay the modern interaction is a podcast and you can do this with different fields and they can explain the behind the scenes and other people can understand so i think it's uh, very brave from your side to switch uh, with this uh, automotive jeweler i saw you did jewelry yeah. um sure, yeah. you did uh, as you said uh, footwear um and it's uh, it's it's crazy but what i meant is it was there like for example you said you have work with saha did uh when mm -hmm. you when for example i take zahadit but maybe you can say someone else that when they called you to say okay we need your help or we need to work with you that you think uh, that you stopped acting that you said okay now i i'm sure i'm uh i'm not anymore just acting as a computational designer i'm actually a computational designer uh well uh Because if tomorrow I get a call from uh, yeah. so, from someone <laughs> from someone that says, uh, "Hello, I'm yeah. I don't know, I'm Patrick Schumacher. I really want to be on your podcast." I'll be like, "What, really? Yeah, like, yeah. so did you have this kind of moment?" No, but I don't think so. And uh, uh, this is not a way to be modest. Absolutely not. Uh, I just. Uh, um, I think that if you do a path like mine, which is again, I really love the way you describe it. You know, this kind of uh, trip from hell uh, toward heaven. Uh, heaven is just a, a kind of illusion, or to be precise, uh, is a destination that you probably don't want to achieve. It's just uh, um, a driver. So, no, I never had this kind of feeling. And uh, it's also important to... Um, sometimes, I said before, it's important to work without any parachute. And uh, it's not only about money. It's also about uh, without every, any kind of mental structure that gives you the illusion that you are good in what you are doing because otherwise you stop learning and then you just repeat yourself the moment where you say yeah i'm not acting anymore is the moment where you start doing the same thing and uh, maybe it works in terms of business because you know uh if you do something which is scalable uh, something that you can repeat and times It probably works in terms of business. Your company grows. Uh, you hire hundreds of people, but you repeat yourself. And uh, since I really love things I'm, I'm doing, and I love uh, this um, uncertain dimension, because it's an uncertain dimension, um, well, you don't think about uh, that moment that you trespass and you feel safe uh, in your new dress of computational designer <laughs> yeah I, i like what you said because actually then everybody that knows the divine comedy knows that everybody reads just the hell because it's the best part <laughs> <laughs> um but um i'm 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 curious because like um i as you said when a person googles you find a lot of things that are very different uh, and different very different designs and i saw the car i saw actually the car um i was very uh, proud that i'm going to interview you because i saw um a football player alvaro morata he's married to his wife i guess her father has a car shop and they share the picture of that car i'm like okay i'm gonna be talking to the designer <laughs> uh, <laughs> what um for example projects like the the car that you mentioned and uh, you have done a set of uh, bracelets and necklaces um yeah. uh, the shoes um in those projects what is your contribution does the, do these people come to you and say, hey, Arturo, we want to de uh, design in this direction? Or um, um, are these people coming with you and say, we have a need of you to inspect our work and we want to achieve this kind of end result and we need your help to direct it? 
Um, well, it basically depends on the client and on the project, but I can simplify the answer saying that uh, sometimes they call me uh, as a consultant and sometimes as a designer. So, for example, for the car, we uh, work as consultants, so uh, we didn't design, as you can imagine. Uh, we I cannot say I designed that car. We work as a consultant for geometric aspects of that car. We also gave a contribution in terms of aesthetic. Uh, you can clearly recognize different like algorithmically uh, generated uh, elements in that in that project, but we were just consultant in a way. And then we work, we collaborated with the design team. Uh, and, and that's a kind of uh, a situation that happens many times. And there are a lot of things I work on uh, that are not published because sometimes, you know, when you work with important companies, uh, you sign a lot of NDA that they, you know, they don't allow you to, to, to publish the projects by yourself. You cannot mention, you are not credited sometimes, but for contract not because they are evil, you know, just because uh, sometimes, you know, you work for important projects that uh, are in the market after six years, for example. So you cannot publish this work in this amount of time. For the jewelry, uh, for the jewels, uh, uh, we were designers, for example, for that specific project. So in that case, you have a brief, you receive a brief, and that brief... Uh, gives you guidelines about the feelings the objects should have, the aesthetic direction sometimes, the materials, uh, the budget that you have for the manufacturing, uh, materials, uh, audience, uh, you know, different uh, uh, indication that helps you to design the project. So yeah, just by simplifying, sometimes I work as a designer and sometimes I work just as a consultant. Yes, I understand. I understand. But um, yeah, it's incredible how like, because it's hard to explain it when you get contacted by a company that makes jewels to, <laughs> to for, as an architect. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Do you define still yourself? Um, do you have any definition of yourself as an architect or you consider yourself completely a computational designer? Okay, that that's the probably the most critical and, and question for me because uh, um, my I have a, um, an architect DNA, but I cannot define myself an architect anymore or just an architect anymore. Or probably this is something that I always say to my students sometimes. Probably the role and the definition of architects is changing because you know if you think about it, the opportunities, again, to create a building, which is a tower or a skyscraper or an airport, for example, they are really limited. In Italy, we have something like 400 architects um, every, I don't remember the ratio right now, but more or less we have... Uh, an architect in every building. <laughs> if you stay in Milano, maybe it's like two of architects in every building. You know, it's something crazy. I did this kind of ratio years ago, and I don't remember exactly, but it's really crazy. So there are not so many opportunities. The competition is crazy. So we probably have to think about reinventing architecture as a profession, I mean, because it's not only, you know, creating experiences is something that architects can do. Uh, creating a good website is something that an architect can do, for example. I know that it sounds so programmatic and not practical, but it's not only to me about making and designing buildings, designing and making buildings. It's something more today. Probably the role of architects is changing. But today I define myself as a designer that embraces all the possible creative expression um you mentioned like that we 
like the, this ratio in Italy and the, the figure of the architect. And um, I am, I am someone that um, I'm the second. Um, I'm a second generation uh, immigrant because my parents moved from Bulgaria to Italy. I just started to settle down, and because of this lack of opportunity. I decided to to move to Germany because there was the opportunity and because uh, I wanted to to live less of a hell as you did. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted yeah. I wanted to 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 succeed. I don't know. So I don't say succeed, but to find my own accomplishment uh, faster. Um, yeah. Was it for you very hard to? did you receive a lot of criticism when you were starting pro promoting your uh, concepts and ideas in um, in Italy and in general like I mean Milan it's more dynamic maybe open I don't know I've never lived there I lived in Rome and Rome it's uh, a city that's very traditional because there are very few modern buildings as you said they are very nice expositions but they're always, always within the historic um yeah. part of the city because this is the the, um, the uh, what makes rome so exciting and so fascinating and what was the how were you received uh within the architectural community and you said you have um you have been teaching um did do you teach only like privately or have you been also invited by university because i started reading the the introduction to the book and it says that it's a uh, uh in cooperation with the a the second book now the algorithm aim design is also in cooperation with the aa somehow as i understood um not exactly i i was um okay i'm trying to answer all the the questions uh, yes so um I started teaching uh, a series of workshops about computational design in Italy, in Rome and Milano for eight, nine years, more or less. Uh, to be precise, we um, it was like 10 years. We, we started 10 years ago. And we probably, we have made something like 500 different events. In parallel, I taught at Politecnico di Milano. And I was in an invited lectures in so many universities from in Rome, um, uh, Bergamo, Pescara, Torino, different cities. Uh, in Italy, in the first time, at the end also, I also I, I taught in different schools uh, all over the world, in the USA, in Australia. I had the, the opportunity to do lectures and uh, really worldwide and i collaborated with aa school and i was the director of the aa rome visiting school that was a 10 days workshop and i was the, the co-director along with um, uh, lorenzo vianello and another italian uh, architect that works in london and we were the directors of this uh, uh, school uh, again 10 days workshop in rome and uh, so that, that that's the connection with the AA that probably the, you um, were reading in the in the front war in the, in the uh, forward probably uh, about uh, being accepted. Actually, I was very lucky because we were talking about buildings in Rome. My first work that I was describing before the the sculpture was a contemporary installation within a Renaissance building. So, I mean, it is a kind of metaphor. It, the, my work was really well accepted and I found, you know, uh, open doors everywhere. So I have to say that Italy was very uh, open to, uh, kind of change in that moment and uh, I really uh, found a lot of um, um, opportunities in Italy and uh, probably after the publication of AAD I started a new dimension and a new phase of my career and I got more work design work and consulting uh, abroad even if if because you know also because um, the acceleration uh, and the velocity, to be precise, of uh, the business in different countries is com 
completely different from uh, from Italy. So probably the side question is like, why you're staying in Italy still? Because uh, um, I always try to not to be flattened in the technical dimension. I always try to stay between art and science, as I said before, because an important part of my work is uh, um, is trying to create objects that um, I always like to say that trigger an emotional response for you know for people. Not only I never design. I repeat myself, I never design for designers or for computational designers. I always try to create a kind of complexity that trigger an emotional feedback. And Italy helps me in, uh, and again, it probably sounds a uh, cliche, but helps me in uh, this kind of connection with beauty, classic beauty. And, and you know, I kind of, um, the fuel is outside the, the digital world and it's about readings, it's about uh, watching movies, it's about the culture that you can, uh, that you have here. And uh, that's absolutely critical for, um, in a way, for fueling my creative work. Yeah. Creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, when I was seeing your design, it's like very interesting because. I could say it's Italian design because it's mm -hmm. the f uh, I think the, um, the the design in Italy because you know I have the luck so to say to know Italy from within and Italy from outside and uh, sometimes from within it's um, very underestimated from outside it's very much overestimated i can balance it out uh, mm -hmm. but um, yeah like uh, for example italian design it's uh, also modern design is full of emotion uh, through the shape of the design mm -hmm. and the meanwhile if you get all the i don't know copenhagen designs and they're the opposite they're like calm they're like in, in, and um, this modern uh, Italian design, it's very much uh, dramatic, more dramatic, more yeah. more emotional. But, you know, I, I always imagine a kind of, uh, let's call it uh, slider with two extreme, a kind of range. And then you have in the design world, you always have an extreme, which is pure functionality and another extreme, which is pure storytelling. Now, Italian design is absolutely... Um, you know, is uh, something that goes in the direction of storytelling. I want to mention something which is not my design, but uh, um, if you think about the monkey lamp by Seletti, I'm doing a kind of commercial, but I'm not <laughs> connected with the company, with the designer. It's a monkey with a lamp that is like hanging, a, handling a, a lamp, for example, or the beautiful chair Nemo by Fabio Novembre, which looks like a mask, for example. They are incredible projects to me that go in the direction of storytelling, but they are also very functional. If you sit on the Fabio Novembre Nemo chair, it's absolutely comfortable. It's also very complex in terms of geomet in terms of geometry, in terms of fabrication. But there is a message, there is a story, there is a kind of contrast because it doesn't look like a chair. So there is a kind of parallel dimension. So I, to me, Italian design is all those things, and it's not pure technicism, but. Uh, Again, it doesn't mean that Italian objects are not precise or not functional, but they try to balance this thing. For example, in a project that I made for the Design Week in 2018, uh, is a furniture, it's called Sistema Fessura, it's a wall system which is super complex to design, complex to manufacture, but uh, the main idea was creating a three-dimensional object starting from uh, the cut painting by Lucio Fontana. So there is a reference. We also try to uh, introduce, to use the same trick of having a box behind uh, in order to amplify the idea of three-dimensionality, for example. And so the 
geometric and the computational part was only one step of a path that involved different things and uh, references and stimuli that in this case uh, they were coming from uh, the love for art for example so that's for me as italian design but sometimes we also have to move the slider in the direction of pure functionality if i work for a car company or i work for uh, you know companies that they need a data-driven design, for example, there is no storytelling. You cannot be a 100% Italian designer. No, it's a very interesting analysis that you did there in a short like sentence because it's very funny. About yesterday, my, my girlfriend, she's a brand strategist, and sometimes uh -huh. she does uh, uh, strategies for brands, and then she comes to me and comes out of nowhere, and she says, um, can you tell me how the commercials of cars in Italy look like? How Italian brands do the commercial of their cars? Uh, how do they describe them and things like that? And then at first I was like, I, I, I've, I haven't been living there for now five years, six years almost. And I'm not never stumbled into a, um, mm -hmm. a commercial. But then I started thinking about commercials that I have seen. And I said, um, Italian car producers, they don't sell you the car, but in the commercial, they sell you what you're going to do with the car. If you yeah. see the commercial for the Cinquecento, they sell you like how you're going to be with your family, how you're going to be with your girlfriend, or they make it kind of funny. So this story, what you're going to do with the car, the car still looks good, but... And the German car producers, they sell the car because they say, if you get this car, they usually drive it through a very nice city. It's a very, you yeah. know, about the uh, car. Yeah, if you think about the, the mission of Audi is uh, Vorsprung durch Technik. Sorry for my German mm. pronunciation. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Uh, the avant-garde of techniques, something yes. like that. Experimentation uh, through technology. <laughs> experimentation through technology. Okay, so... Uh, uh yeah it's a different approach um again uh, if you are totally into technology it doesn't mean that you don't have creativity and the opposite but uh yeah to me italian design is uh, absolutely synthesized by the, the, this idea of creating um a kind of it triggers an emotion Ex experience and, uh, also experience like because yeah. for example italian food is like uh, it's not just food you don't make food you create the whole experience the food needs to be good so that the time with your friends and your family creates a good experience so um this also the same word in italy we don't have something about food i mean we have cibo but in general to express food we say il mangiare which is the act of preparing and and eating we don't use a single word no in general we don't use the word cibo which is the direct analogy with food you know yes and uh, also the same word describes something which is more comprehensive and more uh rich in a way it sounds different from uh, food yes yes and and i think as someone this is why i very much love um, the the luck i appreciate the luck that i have had to study in italy to have my almost whole formation in italy and then have moved to germany where you can translate all this um way of thinking into something practical so that you can still yeah. um and uh, it's a very it's a very nice dualism to have in in your head um and how it it looks like now how is your work day now today uh, um i saw your team on the website it's not a big team a very young team no. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, a very young team. Uh, but what is your work day like? Do you like to keep it also small so that you can stay head on, heads on design actually and not be only a manager? Uh, first of all, I started sleeping uh, in 2016, I guess, 17. So I'm trying to balance the lack of sleep <laughs> on the first uh, stage of my career. Yeah, th that's a great Im like improvement. Um, yeah, I like to, I don't want to turn uh, um, 
the office into a company that's very important and uh, sometimes it uh, sometimes you also have to reject some uh, some project because you know is if you want to do more and more you need to enlarge your team and as you said if you are just the manager you create a distance from research you create a distance from people and so this is not my ambition uh, for me i don't consider the work as a business but as we said before you can you can create you can have a business attitude in creating different and parallel activities like royalties from a book or um you know earnings coming from online teaching or other things they are they can be imagined as a kind of pure business but for me work is an expression so i always try to um to protect uh, a dimension that helps me to be, as you said, hands on and to be uh, always and directly involved in the act of creation and uh, in terms of uh, pure creativity and in terms of computational design. Uh, my team is, for, of course, is, uh, is a young team. I have to say um, it's not that easy to find uh, people uh, with uh, both uh, technical skills and order and also the ability to to jump from a discipline to another one so when for example when we hire new people um it's uh, you know the main characteristic is like uh, having this kind of attitude to have you know a kind of multidisciplinarity approach that's very for us is very very important so technical skill is you know in a way is took for granted but it's very important to have the ability to solve different problems sometimes in the same day and uh, being able to jump from a shoe to a skyscraper that that's important it's not easy actually and the people who are working with you they're very handful amount they probably maybe five or so i don't know and they're yeah. four yeah four with you five I, yeah and sometimes uh, i have a core let's say of people and also um a network of professional that uh, help us on specific problem like problem projects uh, for example i have a network of engineers that help me when we are dealing with specific uh, mm -hmm. uh, problems so they are not uh, uh internal they are not hired but we work with them in specific situation or expert in uh, biomechanical problems for example or coding when we have to develop uh, for example interfaces and yeah we have a core of people and a network of professionals I'm curious, and this core that you have, are those people uh, absolute masters technically uh, that you found? Because I can imagine that through teaching, through writing books, through yeah. all the environment that it's around you, if you say, if you publish an open position for your, for your company, there will be hundreds or maybe thousands of applications yeah um so did you pick the absolute technical masters or also do you i mean dealing with a small team it's easier so i don't know do you focus a lot also on the character of the person not only as you said about jumping through through mm -hmm. um fields of expertise but also like if it fits within the rest of the team you know because if sometimes people don't like each other personally it's also not very easy to work <laughs> you really you you gave the answer basically <laughs> you already gave the answer yes it's important to create a, a team that works uh, well and uh, uh, you know a team is like an organism there is the head you have arms, legs, uh, heart, and whatever. So it's important to create uh, a nice organism. So you cannot uh, hire five or 10 or 12 uh, people with the same skills or with the same attitude. It's, it's a kind of 
really you create a, a good frankenstein you know putting people together and then you have a good organism um that's very important not easy and sometimes it didn't work for example in terms of selection uh sometimes it's very hard to to understand uh, skills and quality from a cv or portfolio it's not good uh, i mean i mean it's not possible uh, i usually like to take coffees with people i want to hire before the COVID. <laughs> right now uh, you know you can do it uh, um, you know organizing a video call a video chat uh, and usually that's enough for me to understand uh, the attitude in a way uh, in front of, of a coffee is better in general i'm not impressed by cv i never to be honest if there is someone that wants to apply and is listening to us i never read the cvs sometimes the portfolios the portfolio uh, helps me in understanding the balance between technical skills and and um i don't know how to say aesthetic vision because there are sometimes you find people that uh, have a you can feel a kind of strong background for example in comics or i remember a cv from a guy that was uh, um was very passionate for sci-fi movies and i recognize this kind of uh, attitude and uh, and dna and in a particular moment it uh, it was really helpful for example uh, i really don't like or to be precise, I don't feel um, uh, any kind of um, connection when I when I like stumble into portfolios that express in a way only the technical parts, or they are the pure translation of algorithms, uh, and I, they basically don't fit in our current dimension which is always, again, uh, in a balance between uh, the uh, aesthetic values and the technical uh, um, proficiency and the technical excellence. And um, how do you, do, you, do you balance now? Do you still sort of balance your assignment that actually pay the bills uh, so that you can still have free time of uh, research innovation or are the assignments themselves research and innovation for you because uh, i can imagine that if you have to jump on a project that's yeah. about automotive that's about uh, mm -hmm. jewelry that's about uh, fashion or uh, whatever you need to do research anyways yeah yeah well, there is the so-called, uh, let's say, applied research, because again, if uh, an automotive company calls you, you need to study, as well as if a footwear company calls you for a performance model of a shoe, for example, you need to study. And so that's the opportunity that you get from a specific client. But in parallel, I always try to understand uh, the direction we are going toward. For example, I'm studying, uh, and it's uh, fascinating and, and so fascinating, uh, machine learning uh, is a kind of daily, uh, I, I try to save, you know, at least 30 minutes per day uh, trying to, to study machine learning, AI. You know, it's a very complex um, uh, field. Uh, but I at least I try to understand, trying to understand the direction where we are going to work. And that that that's very important. So I can answer saying, simplifying, uh, you have applied research that comes from the specific project. And I always try to understand uh, the, you know, the next big game, the next big thing, uh, but not just for, you know, um, not just for being relevant, uh, but because I mean, uh, it's very important for a for a designer, for a creative, to use the most innovative tools uh, available. AI, for example, I mean, 
to me it's a kind of incredible way for pushing creativity i want to give you a super simple example we were working on um we started collaborating for a company that develop watches and you know, you know the watch industry is very conservative you have the digital watches like you know the casio uh, the mini computer and then you have the luxury segment which is super conservative and then every time they create something new is a kind of uh, they blend different styles you know from the past now this is the 70s moment everyone is trying to blend uh, references from 70s okay so we said why we don't do it with uh, why don't we do it with ai instead of uh, combining manually different uh, references from the 70s we create an ai uh, kind of ai that uh, um manages different stimuli and input from the 70s tries to <clears throat> trying to create a watch that looks like a 70s watch but is not generated by you know the human hand and for example it the, the, the output was really really interesting for example and um AI is the next tool to use, machine learning AI, if you if you like. And so th that's important. It's not just for staying relevant because it's the next uh, big thing, but because if you are a creative, you need to use the most innovative tools, the cutting edge tools. And uh, for example, AI is the next big thing. Is is this project open or is it still like behind the scenes and will be? It really... is, uh, no, it was still ongoing and uh, nope, it's not published yet. We're, we're looking forward to, to see the <laughs> AI watch. For example, recently I was um, listening to my favorite podcast is the Joe Rogan Experience. And he had a physicist, I think it was, they were talking about quantum physics and quantum yeah. computers. And they they played songs which were generated by an AI, uh, which one song, three songs they played. One was Jimi Hendrix, one song was Amy Winehouse, and one song was, I think, The Doors and yeah. or no Nirva uh, nirvana and mm. this ai uh learned from the songs that uh, these musicians have done and has created new songs as the algorithm was yeah jimmy yeah. hendrix or M and the amy one house uh song and jimmy hendrix were very very you know like you could think this is totally amy yeah, one so it's yeah. um it's kind of weird it's like freaky this uh this ai and and if you if we have done this sort of uh look back when you started 10 years ago then yes. now and maybe in 10 years it will be maybe it will be i don't know competing with uh m the martians <laughs> or something yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. Awesome. so yeah, it's um, it's uh, crazy how we're we're developing so quickly and i want to ask you one like one last question about your 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 work and about your company um did what what was the progress that you did in parallel to the designer um as a you have to be at least at some level an entrepreneur a businessman uh for from uh dealing with this uh finances and also pricing yeah. yourself mm -hmm. and things like that were there some major things that you learn or some major mistakes that has has happened and then you learn from them or what can you share about this because as you said it's very complex work you need to know all these uh, technical things which are connected to design and you have to know a lot of these soft skills which are um communicate with people understand people hiring people um soft skills are also you know reading all the books about design itself to understand aesthetics and uh, how to approach a project and then you have also these business skills so what do you think are some skills that you have learned that are very useful for you and yeah for, but well first of all there is something that I, I was having a discussion with a friend uh, i think that architects in general they don't have financial education at all i mean 
if they have a personal education uh, dealing with money okay but at school no one teaches or give you you know tips about financial education so i basically learned a lot of books uh, about business in general and they really helped me in uh, understanding you know a basic concept and this is the only advice that i can give which is uh, um when you get money you need to for every project you are working on uh, and then you when you finally um, get money it's important to find uh, um good balance between saving savings reinvesting because it's always something very very critical i mean if you get 100 it's very it's absolutely important to reinvest a part of that money in different activities that sometimes they are not strictly connected with the profession so it helps you in creating a kind of cash flow which is in parallel with um, you know the income coming from the pro from you know the work itself and gives you a kind of foundation of uh, lateral uh, and in this case i'm talking about a parachute that i was av avoiding before in a way and it helps you also in being independent from work in a way and uh, to create a good uh, relationship with clients because you want a job you want to work in a specific project but you don't need it or you don't need it for surviving so that's very important you can do it only if you change mentality it's not only uh saving for the sake of savings but it's it's uh, critical to reinvest part of the money in parallel activity so i just forgive in order to give uh, you know examples i i um i started doing for example trading um or um, um, for example collecting art it's something important and recently collecting digital art <laughs> you know you mentioned the nft I, I i it's something that i found very fascinating i also started creating and buying uh, digital art for example or uh, different activities that are not strictly connected with the you know the architecture and design profession um it's important to create uh, a kind of independence and also it helps you in uh, creating a good attitude and uh, structure also in terms of you know negotiation sometimes i i agree with you i think it's um what you just said makes me think about one quote from uh, this former navy seal joko willing he says discipline equals freedom so if you mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, discipline in your investment in your creating your financial freedom you you have the freedom then to reject projects or exactly. uh, to to decide how to spend your time and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you need to get out of your comfort zone and learn about new new things and um and then then you can succeed but i think this this few we i have uh, recognized a few ingredients uh in your in your path that the people can then extrapolate and uh, maybe use them as a north star for themselves you know like how to how to start and how to 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 get i hope so <laughs> to get where they want to and the, the last last uh, question, I'm trying to build up sort of a collection of uh, stimulus for the listeners. So I ask everybody in the end, uh, what is your, I mean, we have talked about so many books, so many things, but what is your, um, where do you get inspiration from? Uh, whether it's something that's a, a, your favorite book, your favorite movie, it might be your favorite place, uh, your favorite podcast or YouTube video or something that uh, you like to co go back sometimes to and to pick it up and say this inspires yeah, me yeah well it's uh we don't have i think uh, two hours because it will be uh, and you know when someone asks you what's your favorite movie then you stay for five seconds uh, and your mind is completely cleared um some and, and, okay let, let, let's okay uh well 
let's talk about movies. I like different things. Uh, I don't like sci-fi movies, for example. And, and maybe it sounds, if you, if you look my design in a way, it will probably um, uh, look like something uh, um, closer to the sci-fi aesthetic, but uh, uh, I love um, um, all the movies from um, by um, Stanley Kubrick. I will say something really trivial, probably. Um, I love uh, Federico Fellini. Uh, Eight and a half, for example, Otto e Mezzo influenced uh, um, a concept design for a bridge that I have done uh, seven years ago, more or less. In the movie, there is a, uh, an intricate structure that is a, a spaceship. It is called the spaceship in the movie and was a kind of... Uh, I don't know, uh, an influence, a ghost, something that uh, I also had nightmare about that structure. I don't know why, for example, it was an inspiration. And um, I love the, the Western by Sergio Leone, <laughs> for example. Sometimes when I, when I want to disconnect from reality, I like to watch, uh, you know, the Western movies from the, the Italian author. Uh, but I really watched, I like Woody Allen a lot. Uh, there are many movies that uh, are not directly my references, uh, cultural references, if you like. Uh, they are really totally disconnected from uh, the aesthetic. I don't like, in general, uh, movies that are an expression of pure technology, let's say. And uh, instead, in, in terms of... Um, readings uh, if we stay in the architecture field yeah already mentioned delirious new york and uh, learning from las vegas or junk space again from again by um Ren Kulas, they really uh, they were a kind of dynamite in my mind when i was reading them they destroyed all my conception and 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 then with the fragments i recreated a new idea of architecture and design they were absolutely important to me or um, i don't know there are uh, really it's a um, i love 1984 by orwell or i love oscar wilde i love poems uh, uh romance it, it's, uh, it's it's not easy it's not easy to to but i i, I can simplify that i have a kind of um, my cultural references are more oriented and they belongs to a dimension which is more about uh, um the aesthetic expression or about uh, feelings more than uh, a kind of visual stimuli I mean, we can also simplify it by saying reading a lot and uh, watching lots of movies. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, then, thank you very much again for, for being my guest. I don't want to take away of your uh, sleep time because uh, <laughs> you have spent many times uh, sleepless. Uh, you can say for the probably very few people that want to know where to find you, but where can people find you online and find out more about your work? Yeah, uh, my Instagram is, uh, which is Arturo Tedeschi, my name and surname, uh, is the main way that I use to, the, the medium that I use to communicate with uh, other people, where I uh, post my latest projects and, and also, you know, my sketches, my, my pictures. Absolutely, Instagram is the place that I use, uh, the, the, the medium that I use to communicate with people. Uh, I also launched my new website a few hours ago. So in the next uh, weeks, it will be populated by uh, a lot of projects and things that I never published before is uh, my new house in order to collect all the things together. But Instagram is absolutely the preferential uh, way to stay in touch. Perfect. I'll put all the links in the description so that people can simply Thank click. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. It was great. Likewise. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a really a great pleasure. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye. You too. Bye.
Hey friends, thank you very much for listening to this podcast. You've been amazing. Before we go, I just want to remind you that if you want to support us, you can just go on the creativeinsider.com where uh, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter or you can follow us on our social media channels which are Instagram at TCI Podcast or the LinkedIn page, The Creative Insider. Uh, By doing this, you will have a bigger social media presence which always looks attractive to more and more important guests and so this is very fundamental and if you really love what we do and you want to help us doing a better production just click on the patreon link below where you can support us with the wished amount of money you think it's okay for you Uh, it's a monthly subscription but you can cancel anytime so thank you very much and have a good week guys bye bye